Good afternoon. Welcome to the International Peace Institute for today's event on reframing the protection of civilians paradigm for UN peace operations. We're very pleased to co-host this discussion with the government of the Netherlands and the government of Italy. I'm Jake Sherman. I'm the new director of IPI's Brian Urquhart Center for Peace Operations. This policy forum marks the launch of IPI's new issue brief on protection of civilians and a new IPI project currently being developed for 2018 and 2019 to examine the challenges that peace operations currently face in the protection of civilians. As the issue brief notes, these challenges include first, the absence of a unified vision for how to reconcile protection of civilians, political processes, and exit strategies. Second, the tendency of UN missions to implement POC mandates in a mechanistic and siloed manner. And third, an overemphasis on military responses, including the use of force. Through research, convening, and training, IPI's project aims to support the UN Secretariat in defining a new vision for protection of civilians in peace operations that embeds POC in political strategies, clearly defines POC roles and responsibilities across the full range of mission components, promotes tailored approaches that draw on the comparative advantages of different actors and tools, and supports a multi-layered accountability system for POC. I would like to first invite Ambassador Lambertini, the Deputy Permanent Representative of Italy, followed by Ambassador Gregoire, the Deputy Permanent Representative of the Netherlands, to make opening remarks. After the panel and question and answer, uh, assuming that we have time, I will then invite Ambassador Allen, the Charge d'Affaires of the United Kingdom, to offer closing remarks. Ambassador Lambertini, you have the floor. We, we are um, talking here inside. We, we were remembered just one year ago, more or less. We, we had the same um, combination uh, on your initiative on cultural heritage. Uh, I want to remember this because one year ago we were on the verge to enter in the Security Council. And now we are just from some very few weeks from transform from academic and reality the split term. And during this year we had an excellent uh, cooperation collaboration in incredible, even for two countries accustomed to be together in the European Union. Uh, and this is one of the proof today that we are both uh, here. <coughs> Speaking on what you are uh, listening today, the growing number of uh, indiscriminate attack against civilians, school, humanitarian workers, health aid facilities, and other civilian infrastructure make it necessary today to explore the full range of strategy and tools available to enhance the protection and safety of civilians. However, we must recognize that there is a certain protection of civilian fatigue, because while uh, the protection of civilian directives are routinely included in, in uh, almost all mandate of peace operations, there is not a clear strategy on how the POC components can fulfill their mandate and achieve results. UN peacekeeper in MINUS might have a mandate, of course, of protection of civilians, but they need primarily to defend themselves, for instance. In peacekeeping mission in South Sudan and Central Africa Republic, the protection of civilian mandate exists, but cannot be implemented because of the lack of collaboration by the host government. A clear definition of possible political strategy for protection of civilians is therefore needed, also in the framework of the reform of the peace and security architecture envisaged by the Secretary General, and uh, of its focus on prevention. Besides, today there is not a clear and unified vision of the POC in peace operations. More and more, protection of civilians is politically correct label used for a wide range of action, not always justified, raising suspicion and mistrust in relevant part of the membership. My country has always been on the front line to ensure the protection of civilians in the context of the peacekeeping operation, and we are very proud of what we are doing in Lebanon, including through the endorsement and promotion of relevant international instruments such as the Kigali uh, principle. 
During our presidency of the Security Council last month, we adopted a resolution on policing in peacekeeping to strengthen the United Nations police role in protecting civilians. That's why, together with Netherlands, with whom we share not only the term of the Security Council, but also values, idea, and friendship, we decided to support the launch of this long-term program of study and research of uh, IPI. We sincerely hope that this study will lead to enhancing implementation and to an enormous vision on the protection of civilians. Finally, I want to remember um, a dinner that we had in the Dutch residence with most of the panelists here. Um, as you remember, it was a interesting but a little bit groomy discussion. There was a list of all the problems linked with your research. But I want to refer today what I said this night. This is something that we cannot avoid. We can see all the range of the problem, but the fact that we are talking about Kigali principle show that this is something that it's for our future of peacekeeping operation. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. <laughs> Ambassador Gregoire. So thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and and thank you, Inigo. Uh, for your warm words and also thinking of our uh, that we were here together last year speaking about def protecting cultural heritage and actually that was um, as a part of our sp split term in the Security Council um, protecting cultural heritage became one of uh, your priorities uh, during that time and then we hope we can have contributed to that uh, so I hope that this is maybe telling for uh, the priorities for the Dutch participation uh, for being part of the Security Council where peacekeeping will definitely be uh, on the top of our list. Uh, so I hope that this, um, uh, our being here together jointly in IPI is uh, a little bit telling of what we're going to do in the coming year. Um, distinguished panel, dear colleagues, um, I wanted to start um, recalling um, that uh, 20 years ago, um, General Ratko Mladic's army killed over 7,000 Bosnian men and boys in, in, in and around Srebrenica. And two weeks ago, um, Ratko Mladic was finally sentenced to 20 years of imprisonment. And the UN mission in Srebrenica at the time uh, was unable to prevent these heinous crimes from happening. And I think this remains, I mean, in the Dutch uh, national uh, perception, it remains a big scar on our souls. I mean, this is something that profoundly touched and shaped how we look at protection of civilians in peacekeeping operations. And we see that protection of civilians, regrettably, is still as relevant as 20 years ago. Um, and we often see uh, civilians at the epicenter of conflicts, and um, and still too many uh, uh, civilians are victims of these conflicts. And for many reasons, international military missions do not succeed in providing sufficient protection to those civilians. And peacekeeping operations are deployed into dyna dynamic and high threat environments with often lim limited capabilities or mandates. And there is a tendency to focus on the use of force and the military component. And protecting of civilians requires more than physical protection of peacekeep by peacekeepers. And we see that as a shared responsibility. Um, and we see also that we should translate this into a shared, joined up approach. And over in the Netherlands, over the, ne the last decades, we have developed and implemented and integrated uh, approach towards pe peacekeeping operations. Um, and that is not only like integrating is integration in time, where you link the preparation, um, the prevention with the actual operation and the phase that comes after that, but also during the operation, trying to link all available means and instruments uh, to a comprehensive approach. Um, and similarly for these, we, we work in multi-complex settings and um, that's why we think we need a multi, uh, a whole of mission endeavor and a whole of UN endeavor um, to ensure that there is a continuum in, in the, peace, um, uh, the peace efforts and protection of civilians. What we feel is that 
protection of civilians must be more people-centered um, with an effects-based approach and compl complemented by a robust political engagement at the international level. And, and there we must be honest, there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, we feel that protection of civilians or pro successful protection of the civilian is, is at the heart of the credibility and the legitimacy of what the UN does and stands for. So how can we progress on protection of civilians? And that's the question here on the agenda. How can we do better? And that's why I also hope that this discussion today, and I'm looking also at our, our panelists, a very qualified panel to give us ideas and concrete uh, concrete ideas, how we can do that, how we can implement that, but I, because we feel that a lot of our um, credibility relies on that. I thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Gregoire. Let me now introduce the panel. Starting from my right, uh, Dr. Naomi de Raza is a postdoctoral fellow at the International Peace Institute. She authored IPI's issue brief on protection of civilians and is currently developing IPI's new POC project. She previously worked in MONUSCO and in MONUSCA on protection of civilians implementation and worked with DPKO on the recent protection of civilians training needs assessment. Uh, on my left, Mr. Kevin Kennedy is a consultant for the Department of Peacekeeping Operations on protection of civilians and other assignments after a long and distinguished career in the field and at UN headquarters. Ms. Naomi Miyashita is Senior Political Affairs Officer in DPKO's Division for Policy Evaluation and Training, where she covers the protection, civilian affairs, uh, uh, civil affairs, excuse me, and sustaining peace portfolios. Mr. Baptiste Martin, who is currently working on a handbook on protection of civilians for DPKO and was previously a POC advisor in MONUSCO and in MONUSCA, and Ms. Ayaka Suzuki, the Director of Strategic Planning and Monitoring in the Executive Office of the Secretary General. Naomi, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jake. It's a pleasure to launch the, this new stream of work around protection of civilians at IPI today. For this new project, we really want to support the Secretariat in their constant efforts to improve the delivery of protection of civilians mandates by peacekeepers. We see this paper as a starting point to open the discussion and reflect upon ways to either rethink or reorient the way POC strategies and efforts are designed and implemented. After the dramatic failures of the 90s, when peacekeepers failed to protect civilians from genocide and crimes against humanity in Bosnia and in Rwanda, the UN really entered the lesson learning process and started to place POC at the center of its action. Since then, POC has been the object of an incredible development, both uh, as a concept and in practice. These developments led to a real institutionalization of protection of civilians within the UN and to the consecration of protection of civilians as a defining paradigm and a core value for UN peace operations. As a concept, the Security Council has established POC as an explicit mandate for most peacekeeping operations since 1999. The language uh, greatly evolved too to reduce limitations. In most operations, POC is given priority over any other tasks and includes protection from any threat of physical violence by any party. From its side, the UN Secretariat developed specific guidance, training, and policies on protection and a multidimensional and holistic concept of protection. Now, in practice, there has been a real integration and to a certain extent, a professionalization and a rationalization of protection of civilians on the ground. POC advisors were deployed, POC strategies were adopted, and POC tools and coordination mechanisms were created, such as joint protection teams, uh, community alert networks, or protection working groups. However, there are three sets of limitations that we identified in this issue brief as structural issues limiting the effectiveness of protection activities in the field. Um, first, 
the implementation of protection of civilians remains too technical, too mechanistic and bureaucratic. It is very much output focused uh, rather than impact focused. UN staff tend to focus on the activities they put in place rather than the results of these activities. They are focusing on the number of patrols, alert network or protection officers they deploy. They're focusing on the number of investigations they conduct or the number of reports on protection they produce. But there can be a significant disconnect between outputs and outcomes and between the act of protecting carried out by the UN and the state of being protected for local populations. So for example, deploying a high level, high number of patrols can be meaningless if troops always patrol the same main roads where abuse are less likely to happen, or if they fail to effectively interact with local communities to understand the existing threats. In addition to that, the UN bureaucracy is an overburdened machine and marked by complicated processes and administrative flows. This machine is not always fit for the purpose of protection of civilians, which requires to respond to dynamic threats in an agile manner. In a way, the mainstreaming of protection of civilians in the organization condemned the implementation of POC to be bureaucratic and quite constrained. The institutionalization of protection of civilians also contributed to reduce protection to one of the many regular outputs of the missions, which can affect the motivation of staff implementing it. Now that protection of civilians is systematized and mainstreamed, there is a certain dilution of responsibility for protection of civilians within the system. As a result, UN staff tend to implement protection of civilians maybe more dispassionately and mechanistically and to overly rely on the bureaucratic machine supposed to be in charge of protection of civilians. And this lack of individual commitment is often aggravated by the lack of accountability measures for protection of civilians. Now, beyond this technical implementation, uh, there is also a significant disconnect between protection of civilians and political strategies. Protection of civilians has been included in the mandate of peace operations as a label without much consideration for its feasibility, its relevance, or its strategic meaning, and without much consideration for the way it is supposed to support and to be articulated with political solutions and sustaining peace. In the Central African Republic, in Mali, or in South Sudan, peacekeepers are mandated to protect without a clear political strategy to end the conflict and without a viable peace process in place. And there is a general perception that even if the political process is told, the mission can still do POC. In this context, uh, POC has been increasingly perceived as a separate task that may contradict or compete with the support to political processes or with capacity building activities for the extension of state authority. This division, or let's say this perceived division and perceived tension between uh, political solutions and protection of civilians has led POC to be criticized uh, recently as a short-term task likely to distract from exit strategies. Thirdly, there tends to be too much focus on, on the use of force by military components of the missions, including robust peacekeeping, uh, including offensive operations to protect civilians. This has led the UN to downplay unarmed strategies to protect civilians from the police and the civilian components. Police officers and civilians have a wide range of expertise uh, and possible streams of work when it comes to um, political negotiation, threat analysis, mediation, human rights monitoring, or DDR, that all contribute to protection of civilians. But these activities are not always prioritized or not always used effectively. So, in this issue brief, we are making three sets of recommendations to respond to these issues. First, UN missions should shift to an, an impact-driven implementation of protection of civilians. They should better link the execution of protection of civilians tools and activities to appropriate planning informed by solid and thorough analysis of risks and impact, and to outcome-focused and de uh, outcome-focused decision making and risk taking. Then the UN should anchor protection of civilians in political strategies. To this end, there needs to be a renewed commitment of member states to link both agendas. 
There also needs to be a change in the UN organizational culture so that mission leadership teams would provide this politically led vision to define appropriate POC strategies on the ground. And finally, missions should adopt tailored and modular approaches using the full range of armed and unarmed strategies to protect civilians. Beyond military action, missions should explore the continuum of possible postures and actions by the different components, which should be seen as part of a toolkit. And mission leadership should pick, sequence, and prioritize activities that would be the best fit and have the most added value in addressing specific threats in certain areas towards certain actors at certain times. And they should constantly adapt the use of this toolkit according to the day-to-day -day analysis and mapping of threats, political dynamics, opportunities for influence, potential leverage, and risks. So for example, it could mean um, focusing exclusively on civilian activities in areas where there is space for political mediation, uh, and dialogue, but where troops are not welcome because they are seen as siding with one party to the conflict. It could also mean stopping capacity building activities in an area where local authorities are actually fueling violence. Um, or it could mean adjusting the balance between civil affairs and DDR activities in areas where tensions between ethnic groups get out of control and where the urgency is to disarm self-defense militias. So to conclude all these efforts to frame POC within sound political visions and to implement POC mandates in an impact-driven, tailored, and modular way would contribute to smarter delivery of protection mandates in the field. They would also enable the establishment of a multi-layered and reliable accountability system that can only be initiated once there is political support, a clear division of labor and responsibilities, and tailored and reasonable approaches. I will stop there. Great. <clears throat> Thanks, Naomi. Kevin, you last year led uh, the evaluation of mission protection of civilian strategies, and I think we'd all be very interested to hear your thoughts on the issues that Naomi has just framed. Thanks. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me. Thank you. Um, let me first of all, I mean, I, I realize that this is an awkward way to begin, but for any of you who expected another Kevin Kennedy <laughs> at this session, um, given the nature of the session, um, I am the evil twin of Kevin M. Kennedy, uh, former coordinator for humanitarian relief in the Syria context. Um, we were both in the UN for about 20 years together and it confused everybody. So that, uh, let me just make it clear, my place here really comes from my last 20 years at the UN, which was spent working very closely with peacekeeping operations in a variety of ways. Um, I left the Secretariat in 2014, and since then have been working with DPKO and DFS on a variety of things. Uh, my last two posts in DPKO were as the head of training and as head of the Mali team. So just to give you a sense of, of why I'm sitting here and why I would be involved in this. Um, Nemi and I have had a good conversation about the issue paper that IPI has, has uh, launched. I think it's really an excellent paper. I think we all find a lot there to agree with. There are resonances, certainly. Um, I have some issues with it, uh, and I hope that those can be discussed a bit. But the evaluation that we did last year on mission-specific POC strategies was an internal evaluation requested by the leadership of DPKO and DFS in light of what has happened on the ground and at headquarters in trying to implement this really very difficult mandate. Let's bear in mind that back in 2009, it was the Security Council and the C-34 that called on the Secretariat to ensure that there were mission-specific POC strategies for peacekeeping missions. This came on the heels of a joint study that was done or commissioned by DPKO and OCHA, which concluded that essentially peacekeepers were making it up as they went along. There was no doctrine. There was really no machinery. There was very little by way of exchange and lessons learned. And there was very little by way of structure, both within missions and at headquarters, to support the POC mandate. It was an excellent study and proof that the humanitarians and peacekeepers can work together. Um, so it came out with some very important criticisms, but pointed the way to a series of things that the Secretariat has done, TPKO, DFS, and the field, in terms of trying to move the ball forward. Um, as a result of that study and as the result of the work that was done in 2010, 
and I'm sorry if I've, most of you are probably aware of this, but I think it's good to keep the history in mind. In 2010, you had an operational concept for POC developed by DPKO and rolled out in the field. Uh, and you had, by 2015, a full-fledged policy. Uh, in the meantime, you had training materials at the strategic level and ultimately at the tactical level to be used by member states in preparing their uniformed personnel and for civilian training. Uh, and you had, in 2015, guidelines for military components in implementing POC mandates. In the field, there has been an enormous amount of very good faith and diligent effort to create structures and functions and to roll out procedures and practices to try and give effect to protection of civilians as a whole of mission effort. Um, and I think while I understand the IPI's position paper in criticizing that as perhaps being overly technical or mechanistic and institutional, uh, as somebody who was institutionalized for almost 40, 40 years in the UN, um, there's something to be said for institutionalization when it comes to getting people together who are not accustomed to working together, uh, who don't necessarily share the same understanding of the mandate, who don't share the same information, and who are coming from different disciplines. So I take the point that Nami makes that, yes, perhaps we have reached a stage where POC is looked at as a bit through a little bit too mechanistic a lens, a bit too bureaucratic a lens, but let's look at why. What, is, what are the missions trying to compensate for? What is the Secretariat trying to compensate for? They're trying to compensate for, with apologies to members of the Security Council here present, um, to a very divided council, to very different approaches to POC by many of the actors, including the host countries where we are deployed. Um, and perhaps it's a little bit like that old poster a colleague of mine had in his office. He said, when you don't know what else to do, hold a meeting. Um, the idea of creating structures where people could share plans, could co construct plans together, that obviously takes on enormous amount of, of importance in the day-to-day -day work of people. But I, I, I part company a little bit with the notion that all of that is only output driven. It is impact driven, but the impact is limited. And it's limited by what? It's very often limited by exactly that kind of, the lack of political clout, the lack of resources, the lack of, uh, of assets that the missions have to deploy in very difficult circumstances. So the evaluation uh, that we came out with last year, which was an internal evaluation, it was not published, um, as uh, DPKO evaluations, DPF, DFS evaluations are, basically um, came out at the same conclusion as your IPI paper has, uh, which is, first of all, we, there really has to be a stronger strategic political approach and political engagement. It's needed to support peacekeepers' efforts to protect civilians. Now, DPKO and DFS personnel recognize that strategic considerations relating to POC and implementation of the POC mandate are important, but frankly, they don't appear very high on the agenda, either of the integrated operational teams or of the senior management of DPKO and DFS. Um, for example, when I pressed my colleagues, and I speak as someone who's guilty, I, I include myself in this, when I asked them if they had ever gone to the council and asked for time just to brief specifically on the POC strategy for Mission X as part of their engagement with the council, the answer was no. Ah, the POC strategy is a mission-owned document. And yet, in retrospect, and I, I failed to do this both as the head of the Great Lakes team and as the head of the Mali desk, I failed to see in that the opportunity to ec educate the council, to adjust expectations, and also to inform the reporting and inform the further decisions of the council. Yes, it, it often comes down into the weeds and it gets very technical, but that is to say that the, maybe the capstone, not to misuse a word that's used in peacekeeping, uh, the capstone of our recommendation was first, of, first and foremost, um, P, POC needed to be considered a key strategic priority of the mission it needed to be embedded in the mission's political strategy. Interestingly enough, in the course of our discussions with people, and we 
we looked at, uh, all together we looked at nine missions, we visited three missions, and we were, the team was very familiar with all of them. When we sat and actually quizzed people in the field and at headquarters about where POC fitted in the political strategy, almost no one was able to articulate that. And in fact, many of the uniformed personnel that we talked to dismissed the notion that you could even have a POC strategy because the political strategy was lacking, because the overarching political support from the level of the Security Council on to place pressure on actors that were likely to threaten uh, civilians was not there. So the mission could compensate, but only up to a certain point. Now, there were others, to be fair, who took the position they sidestepped the question of whether or not POC strategy was, was even possible, but focused instead on changing business as usual a more robust approach, a more joined up approach. And that's where we come to the, the structural issues, and I think Nami has mentioned them. Um, there's nothing like a crisis, particularly a POC crisis, to reveal to you your strengths and your deficiencies. POC tends to bring out systemic weaknesses that exist within peacekeeping. Among those are, of course, lack of intelligence and situational awareness in real time lack of integrated planning. Perhaps one of the things that we heard most frequently from everyone across the spectrum, both on the civilian and military side, was a plea for integrated operational planning cells where all of the components ultimately fed into one planning group that would join up what the force was doing and what the different civilian components were doing in order to project a POC, uh, a, a POC stream of activity. Um, so this was among our, was among our conclusions. I, I'm, I'm being flagged, so I, I, I will try and, and, and wrap up very quickly. Aside from these systemic issues that are clear in many peacekeeping missions, um, is the issue of preparedness and training. The operational readiness uh, system that's been established by DPKO goes some way toward helping to raise the bar on the readiness of uniformed personnel coming into theater. But our conclusion was, and I think it's a conclusion that you will find in every after action review, every BOI, every report that's done after a POC crisis, or in general a crisis, is that training is essential. You have a huge turnover in peacekeeping personnel. You have a constant drain of institutional memory. Again, institutionalization is not all bad. Uh, and ultimately, you have people moving into theaters where they are very unclear. Now, there, a lot has been done in the field of training, but the problem is there's no overarching architecture for that training. And even though now there is a self-certification of troops coming in that they've had sufficient mission-specific uh, pre-deployment training, it can't stop there. What's really required is a very sustained effort toward pre-deployment and in-mission training on mission-specific issues, scenario-based, tabletop exercise-based, that truly gets everyone around the table and pushes the integrated approach. Um, so if there were three big things that came out of our evaluation, one is essentially to reiterate what the HIPPO report said, was that politics rules the roost, and that if there is a lack of political support for the POC agenda, then we cannot really succeed. The second is that we need to address these systemic weaknesses that exist in peacekeeping across the board, and third, that training is not a one-shot deal. One of the, as, as head of training, one of my great frustrations was very often people would come forward and say, oh, we've just created a great module. We've just run out a great training of trainers. And then it would stop. The fact is, there needs to be, there needs to be a school for protection of civilians. And in fact, um, one of the force commanders we interviewed said, you know, at the military academy, they don't treat you, they don't teach you protection of civilians. So unless it's institutionalized at the member state level and at secretariat and at mission level, then you don't get the sustained effort that you need. So I'll leave it there. I, I look forward to a good discussion. Jake, thank you. Great. Thanks, Kevin. That was, that was fantastic. Um, Naomi, let me turn to you. Uh, your office, DPET, is the institutional home within DPKO for policy and guidance on protection of civilians, so um, please share, share your thoughts with us. Thanks. 
Thanks a lot, Jake, um, and uh, thanks for organizing the event and for inviting us to, to think about a reframing of, of, uh, of POC, and I hope I'll be adding to, to the debate. Um, I mean, one thing I would, I would wager is that the discussion paper um, may have changed the frame, but the picture inside the frame remains the same, and it hasn't, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty much um, in line with, the, with that picture that was painted by the hippo, which I think continues to be relevant. Um, but I'd like to react to, to three of the main contentions in the, in the paper and um, maybe do it in a bit of a controversial way to make things interesting. Um, so the first point on anchoring POC in, in political strategies, I think now we've repeated it so much uh, since the hippo that it's, it's become a, a bit of a truism, a bit like motherhood and, and apple pie. Um, but I'd like to take that thought um, further in, in two different uh, and opposite directions. The first thing is uh, that I think what we actually need is a broadening of POC away from um, an IHL-driven understanding uh, towards one that is really anchored in conflict prevention. Um, an approach that conceives of POC as a fulfillment of, of uh, rights and obligations, I think you could argue detracts from a political response and, and feeds into a response that is uh, force-based. Um, the concept of physical protection, which implies protecting somebody from something, um, suggests a passivity and, and, and removes agency from the people that, that are the subject of, of protection. And I would say that if we want to take a truly um, political and analytical approach, um, one that goes beyond the immediate act of violence that, and one that tries to understand the motivations and the interconnections between actors and, and conflict, um, then uh, you know, we would be if we if we actually do manage to go beyond the immediacy of, of, of the act of violence, then that's how we can actually get towards a, a preventive approach, which I, I think is really what we want to do um, with POC. And if we are serious about having a people centered approach, uh, which is what the hippo very rightly said we should be doing, um, then we also need to understand better what the views of, of the, the subjects of protection are and their capacities um, actually also to, to, to take um, their, their fate in, in their own hands. And to make this sound a bit more real, I, I'll use the example of, of Mali, where central Mali, where for the past two or three years in the mission and others, we, we've been hearing about a, a growing, uh, growing tensions, intercommunal tensions amongst communities in the Mopti area, but also disgruntlement vis-a-vis -vis the state. And that was something that was brought to the attention of, of, of the mission a few years ago, but unfortunately, for various reasons, the mission didn't seize that opportunity actually to, to address it through preventive diplomacy, through, uh, through good offices. Um, and I think we really missed a, we missed a chance there to actually do a really upstream uh, POC and really sort of protect civilians you know, from, from the get-go before we have to deploy the uniformed personnel to, to actually sort of start doing physical um, protection. Another example I would give is, is actually a bit more hopeful and, and, and ties into what uh, Kevin and, and uh, Nami have been saying. And that's on a sort of a more um, granular understanding of what the threats to civilians are. And we look at uh, the mission in, 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 the, in the Congo, MONUSCO, they're actually doing something, they're innovating, that's a laboratory for POC innovation, has been noted many times. The latest thing that they're doing is, is looking at developing tailored armed group strategies. So looking at um, you know, the FRPI, looking at the ADF, and, and understanding you know, what is it that motivates those armed groups to attack civilians. Um, so it's understanding the political economy, it's about understanding the, the connections with other groups, with governments in the region, um, and, and trying to figure out how they can deploy the different tools and resources at the disposal of the mission, not just uniformed, not just the military or the FIB, um, but also leveraging community violence reduction approaches, um, the stabilization uh, funds that they have. Uh, so bringing together the mission as a whole to respond to that armed group in, in particular locations in, in the Congo. And I think that's, um, that's really, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting way forward. We'll see, I mean, you talked about impact. Let's see, let's see what uh, impact can be had through that approach. But I think that that's uh, really the, the right direction to go in. 
So the first point is really about broadening our conception of, of POC to encompass uh, prevention and, and conflict resolution, not only at the national level, but very much at the provincial and the, and the local levels, and leveraging the resources that the peacekeeping operations have beyond uh, uniformed uh, personnel and uniform capabilities to be able to do that. The second point I have on anchoring POC in, in political strategies is that we really shouldn't be afraid to say that we're doing POC even if the political process is stalled. Um, you know, sometimes there are real life and death reasons why uh, we need to be present, we need to protect by uh, deterrence, um, you know, we need to use proactive force and so on uh, in order to protect civilians. And that's a lesson that, uh, that was, we learned in the 1990s, uh, the DPR mentioned it at the, at the outset of the event. It's still valid today. Um, and in places where we're, de we're deployed, where the political process has fallen apart, in places such as uh, South Sudan, uh, or where we have very slow progress on the political front in Darfur, I would argue that there is still merit anyway for, for us uh, to be present, because we are actually playing an important immediate function of, of protecting uh, civilians. So I don't think we should dismiss missions uh, as failing because they haven't achieved in and of themselves um, a political solution. So I have a lot more to say, but I'm, t I'm being told that I've only got one minute left. Um, so just two other points. Um, on, um, <clears throat> on the issue of, uh, of accountability, I, I think, you know, Kevin has touched on some of this. At the moment, we, the, the, what we're doing in DPK and DFS is actually all about accountability. And it's all about accountability for delivering on POC mandates, the strategic force generation process that we're undertaking, the ORA that uh, Kevin has mentioned, um, you know, some, some of the, the mechanisms that are happening at headquarters, but also in the field in terms of tracking uh, impact on POC and uh, performance in MONUSCO um, is very much about making ourselves accountable at the mission level Level, but also at the headquarters level to be able to deliver on POC. And we're now also starting, we've uh, done a, a number of briefings to the C-34 on um, a new approach that we have of accountability for of senior leadership um, to deliver on, on, on POC. And that's something that I think, um, you know, we will take forward as we, uh, as we look at the revision of the POC policy. Um, and then uh, maybe finally just to say on the, the point of the institutionalization of, of POC, um, I mean, I, it does resonate for sure, um, but I also think it's a bit unfair because, um, you know, many of the peacekeepers, the, the sort of the, um, the what, what is termed as kind of the bureaucratization of POC, whether it's the community alert networks or, uh, you know, early warning networks, the CLAs that we're deploying, community liaison officers, uh, you know, these are basically all response, creative responses that people in the field have developed uh, to actually try to help <laughs> civilians. Um, and so, and, and to tap into local knowledge and, and guide our actions. So, I wouldn't dismiss, you know, what, what we're trying to do continually to try to sort of adapt our responses, you know, out of hand. I wouldn't dismiss that out of hand. Um, and then finally, just to say um, two things, uh, just going forward, um, one of the issues that we need to start grappling with is the changing nature of conflict and the fact that, you know, POC cannot be done in the same way everywhere. So if, in a place like Mali, you can't actually deploy these forward operating bases and, and have sort of like a, a prevent, a sort of a protection by, by a present sort of approach. We need to be much more... Um, adapted to the actual context that we're operating in. Um, and I think the type of environment such as uh, Mali, which is, seems to be the, the new kind of uh, typology of conflict that we're facing, not only in peacekeeping, but for SBMs as well, we need to, to start thinking about how, how we actually um, support uh, protection in, in those environments. Um, and then finally, I, I, it's my hope that Ayaka will, will talk a bit about uh, some of the SG's reforms, because I think a lot of you know, the difference that we would be able to make on POC uh, will kind of you know, depend on, on, on how much uh, progress and, and how much change we can bring into the sort of the supra machinery of, of the Secretariat and, and how missions are supported uh, in the field. Thanks. Thanks very much, Naomi. Baptiste, you are working on uh, the POC handbook, which uh, is intended to provide guidance for field missions on exactly how to do this. And, and you've personally um, 
face the challenges of, of implementing POC in, in a number of missions in, in the field. So please, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, so I'm talking after uh, my former boss and the current person in charge, so I'll try to <laughs> navigate uh, within, the, within that context. Uh, but I think uh, what, I'll, what I'll try to focus on is, is complement them from field perspective. Uh, how we've lived the last 10 years, and I'm currently not on, on a BPKO contract, I'm supporting that, that, that work for the handbook, um, but, but I've seen uh, over the years how DPETS in New York was learning from specific experiences and, as Kevin was saying, learning from the challenges, developing a tool, developing a way to respond to that challenge, and then we identify, we learn the lessons here, and we develop the guidance. Uh, in the concept, the operational concept 2010, I was in admiss at the time. It was that six and a half chapter POC mandates uh, where the military and the civilians in 2009 sat, sat together and that lesson was learned and the concept was uh, spread for, the, for, for all the missions. Uh, in admiss, we had that POC section uh, so a lot of officers in the field, and it was a mixed humanitarian uh, POC approach. So then it was debates around the concept, okay, what is POC, is it, uh, is it the humanitarian POC, uh, how do we do uh, human rights in that context, what's the link, and what should be the role of the POC advisors versus a human rights officer versus etc. So the, the, the lessons have been learned on the angle of, uh, okay, role of POC advisors, uh, and uh, then in MONUSCO, on all the, the challenges they had in, in that mission. Uh, it was generally a massacre or a mass rape for community liaison assistance and for joint protection teams. They were created after one major crisis, one major challenge, and, and the mission was the one. It was not we all had ways to engage with communities, uh, but it was the one that formalized that model. It was civil affairs, it was human rights, it was different colleagues that sat together and said, okay, let's write an SOP, let's have the former st uh, formal, uh, format standard and training module to make sure uh, we have the preparedness. So this is what's been, been learned from MONUSCO and then captured uh, in, uh, in HQ, in training modules, in, uh, okay, what are the tools that work? Uh, how do we re replicate it and adapt it in other missions? Having a national staff uh, in Darfur is not the same as having a national staff in Central Africa or in Mali on a, how you can work with them or where you can send them, uh, whether they may be, may be related to the local politics or not. Uh, so all this you have to tailor, but, but, but those tools were born, I would say, a lot of them, coordination mechanisms, early warning tools uh, in MONUSCO. Now we have new, and this is what I'm trying to do now, is, is in 2014-15, uh, I was uh, brought here, we worked on the policy, and we tried to address the challenges we had at the time. Confusion on, okay, what's included in, in terms of uh, incidents? Criminality, is that included? A, a raid from, a, a, you know, a group on a, a cattle raid in South Sudan. Is that related to the conflict or not? We had commanders in the mission, strategists, telling us this is not POC. We're looking at SAF, SPLA, <laughs> we're looking at strategic. Uh, conflict. And I think that's one lesson uh, we've learned over the years, is a tactical issue can become a strategic issue on POC. It's visible, everyone expecting the PKO to do that and to do that first. So how do we do it and how do we sort all the organization planning, etc. Uh, this is the details of the how to uh, uh, its ongoing work. But at first it was, okay, who? <laughs> Uh, what are the threats and uh, what do we include in there? And do, do, are we sure everyone understands that? And then the second part was, and everyone was looking at the use of force, why US studies, like everyone is foc focused on that and pointing at the military. Why didn't you do that? And how do they react? Who's helping me? Who's giving me a vision? Where is the joint plan? And what's my role in that joint plan? So that, that political vision they're looking for uh, in some missions, you've had instances where they've created this operations coordination planning team where they come together and where the military systematically, this is something we, we, we did in MONUSCO when I was there, having, making sure you have when the field commander is planning his offensive operation, that you have a standardized way of analyzing political risks, POC risks, risks to the staff, and integrate that as a process and educate all our military colleagues coming in not used to dealing with civilians, humanitarians or, or else, and not knowing how to include them in that planning. So this is for civilian leadership and the structural issue to be sorted. Uh, so in the policy, we sorted some of those. 
saying, okay, what are the threats? Uh, what are defining a little bit? We provided definitions. Uh, and we went into a little bit the how-to. But then I had two main topics we were discussing at the time with the C34 uh, on different policy discussions here. Monitoring and evaluation, accountability. So all this, it's about, for, for me, the process was we identify a mission where it's been done well, where they've tried, and uh, the military never write an SOP out of nothing. You look at an existing process, an existing experience, and that's uh, the moment you write the SOP. Uh, so you identify the best practice, you see how they've tried to deal with it, and you try to adapt it, standardize for all the missions. Or, and that's for the policy, but then in the handbook, we can say, okay, in that context, you will have a symmetric threat environment. Everyone's shooting at you first, so engaging with the community is more difficult. All your capacities, I was in Mali earlier this year, the military are keeping our compounds, <laughs> protecting the humanitarian staff, protecting our staff. So NATO officers have learned that, that I found in, uh, in MINUSMA, telling me in, in Afghanistan we sorted the problem. We added troops. <laughs> it just requires more security capacity. Uh, when you have today the police with 10% capacity of the military patrolling more than the military. It's just an issue of the capability. But it's not only the capability, it's uh, the expectation. Uh, and, uh, and so on, on the, 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 I mean, coming to now, so the policy sorted some issues. We have outstanding challenges, the hippo, uh, uh, the, the, the paper, I think all, I uh, will not come to that, like do raise the issues. The way I see missions uh, on those main topics uh, working, uh, what I've seen this year, I'll just take two, uh, two, three topics. The first one, it's, how do we do POC in different contexts? You have Lebanon, Haiti, Ivory Coast. They were, ask, they were asking us, they were like, we have POC as a priority one, but there's no ongoing violence. There are no civilians killing right, uh, right now. So what should I do on POC? It's about institutional building, environment building, and be ready in case there's insecurity. Uh, in a mission where it's uh, a lot of uh, violence, uh, then how do we prioritize everything towards POC? Is everything POC or not? And then how do we define? In MONUSCO, we had stabilization, was a big set of coordination mechanisms, etc., and POC. So it was the two pillars of the mission. Having an operations planning team when you develop uh, a, a joint vision of the priorities and mobilize all the activities, including uh, not only the firefighting that is often understood as POC and discussed 80% of the discussions on POC forum. It's about the latest crisis and how we respond to it. But yes, of course, uh, capacity building for the state army, of course, trying to read the root causes will be the long term. So it's about the sequencing. It's about how much you would put in a specific context on the firefighting versus trying to sort the issues long term, the long term political process. Of course, that will uh, be the way to sort POC in the end. But we will jeopardize the long-term political process if we do not address that specific issue at hand right now, even if it's tactical, if it's not, even if it's not a strategic threat. And this is where, in, in MONUSCO, for example, a, few, a couple of months ago, uh, reviewing with them the, the strategy there, it was about how do we prioritize? We have these strategies on arm groups. Now it's about, OK, what are the two, three main topics we want to work on? Should we go for Kalimi, where we have intertribal? Conflicts. Is that the strategic threat? <laughs> uh, and what's the link maybe behind to spoilers? So this is where the political approach, looking at, and, and, and for me, it's first reconciling. I see a lot of opposition conceptually, non-military versus political approach. For me, it's not too opposed. In peacekeeping, and it's close with, and it's security is in support of the political approach. And our military colleagues are asking for that. They're asking for that vision. And they're asking not to be left alone in the field and pointed out for not doing it. It's about working the phones. It's about uh, seeing the strategic threat that will come because it is the spoilers behind. It is the strategic spoilers, economic, financial, etc., that can be in political parties, that can be in the region, they can be outside the country, they can be in government, they can be anywhere. Uh, so it's about doing that mapping. It's about identifying them. It's about sharing the load between the field and the HQ on who will do what, and making sure we have that key uh, leader engagement, that influence strategy. And then we go to them and we deter. And to deter, of course, if you have troops, <laughs> you have more chance to deter. But it's just the little stick, the little warning <laughs> for credible deterrence. So that's the concept we inserted in the military guidelines. 
we said in the military guidelines, okay, the how-to tactically, uh, we, give, we give a little details because then we need to clarify. It's not only defense, it can as well be offense under the POC mandate. In MONUSCO, we're doing joint operations before the FIB mandate on the FDLR. They were not about to attack. Uh, so it was not the authorization, it was about how we do it. And so the security uh, action in, in, in support of the political action, uh, this, I've seen it uh, concretely work. And 90% of the situations you have, if you do it this way, and if you really have that synchronization of effort, but you do not want to depend on a personality, you have to create the system. So you need your colleagues at the tactical level to have uh, an operation center and to discuss it every week, uh, review. So, so this is the nitty gritty uh, of how to reach that political uh, uh, strategy and make the link with the leadership. But it needs the leadership to look at uh, the situations tactically and support and give the, the proper guidance. On uh, one, one uh, last point I can, I can do, uh, so the, the political approach is, is one. It's the issue of the, the use of force and when to use force. Uh, we have all the, uh, the, 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 the colleagues in the field, very, and, and a field commander, it's about comforting them that they are part of a bigger picture and, and, and they will do it. But it's as well that, that we support their action and with the risk analysis to make that decision and, and have the risk mitigation measures in place. And if you have shown, we, we cannot promise that we will have no collateral damage in, in a military operation. It's the nature. What IHL requires you, what the rules of engagement re requires you is make sure you have the mitigation measures in place and standardizing that in all the missions uh, will uh, you know, address that fear as well of the commander of going ahead uh, and being supported by, by his leadership for when we do need to uh, you know, le leverage that security action in support of the political process that it's actually done because that's the credibility part of the deterrence. Uh, they will soon test you and, and know you're not serious and then uh, you lose the, the, the political battle. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Super. Thanks very much, Baptiste. Finally, let me turn to you, Ayaka, uh, for your thoughts um, from the vantage point of the Secretary General's office. Great. Thank you. Thank you. But I also bring a lot of baggage of long association of peacekeeping. <laughs> Um, as I was the uh, uh, a very junior desk officer for Sierra Leone, which was the first peacekeeping mission that was um, given the mandate of protection of civilians. So um, reflecting from, from that, that time, really indeed a lot has been done to improve the way peacekeeping, uh, peace operations um, discharge the task of protection of civilians. And I, I really am convinced that, that, that this issue is treated much, much, much more seriously now by the United Nations. And I also agree with my colleagues that, um, that, that indeed inst institutionalization is a good thing, but I also agree with Naomi's point that that's not enough. And what strikes me is that, that there is, is a sharp contrast between the, 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 in a way, professionalization and, uh, or if you like to say, institutionalization of our response on one hand, and then the growing expectations on, on, on the part of the, and, and rightly so, and, and then amidst the increasingly difficult environment that we're in, and then, and then the, the, the not so uh, solid consensus by member states on this issue. So, in order to, to get it right, I think all, all of you would agree that it, it's a group effort. I mean, peacekeeping operations have to do it right, but it also requires the full uh, par participation and buy-in of the key member states and, of course, the, the stakeholders on the ground themselves. So this is this is a very uh, pertinent issue. It's um, as 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 some of you know, um, the Secretary General established uh, what is known as Executive Committee, which is like a cabinet-style decision-making forum, which meets weekly. And this has come up twice um, on the agenda of the Executive Committee recently, as recently as um, early November. And the, the, the first time they met to talk about this, they had more action points than any other topics. So that just shows you how much importance Secretary General attached to this issue. 
um, I, I talked about the, uh, the, 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 the the gap between the, the, the tools and then the, the impact that Naomi was also talking about, because ultimately peacekeeping is not, can never be a replacement for substitute for lack of political will. Um, so therefore, one of the one of the, um, the 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 action points is to increase engagement with member states. Kevin also mentioned in hindsight that maybe he could have done more to engage with the Security Council. That's precisely what um, but what the uh, the the, the uh, members of the Executive Committee thought that they should do much better in terms of having a very um, frank and 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 and, and uh, dedicated discussion on the. Ex exactly the, the, the expectation that, that the members have on peace operations in terms of um, protection of civilians as well as on critical challenge posed by host countries who sometime, um, let's just put it this way, are not conducive themselves to, to enabling this uh, mandate to be implemented. Naomi also mentioned I mean, there is very much a clear linkage between uh, the protection of civilian um, agenda with the Secretary General's focus on prevention and reforms. Ultimately, the aim of the reform proposal is to be able to deliver on the UN's mandate much, much better. So there is much, much uh, there. The, the, it's all it's all uh, part of the package. And as you know, um, those of you who are here, the Secretary General is actively engaged in consultation with member states to try to 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 move on all three major streams of the reform. That is the development system reform. The second report will come out in two weeks. The, the, the management reform and peace and security architecture reform in order for the UN to be much more nimble, to be able to act uh, flexibly and for the entire continuum of the instrument to be used. And even at the, uh, in the development system uh, reform discussion, there is a lot more emphasis on collective results so that the, the fragmentation of the UN system uh, will not impede effective UN action. Um, I also wanted to just mention, just from the, uh, the perspective of the, um, of, the, uh, of the Executive Office of the Secretary General and Executive Committee generally, our principals also are increasingly concerned about protection of civilian um, challenges in so-called non-conventional situations. Uh, so, not classical conflicts where we have peacekeeping uh, operations necessarily, but for example, um, so-called uh, Northern Triangle where there's um, organized crime, where there is still, a, even even if there are no in the armed conflict as such, there is a very large number of civilians who are being affected. They're also concerned about uh, increasing number of forced displacement, and particularly, I mean, as we, we need to do much better in mission settings, but just not to lose sight of the fact that there are major protection of civilian challenges in many non-mission settings as well. So the, one of the, one of the um, key action points from the, the, the first time the executive committee met is to try to have a more, system-wide approach to protection of civilians. As you can imagine, different actors within the UN system speak different languages. So even on issues like protection of civilians, peace actors may have different uh, definition or how to go about it compared to other actors. So, so a lot of work is being done on that. So uh, system-wide coherence, we also feel, uh, is, is very, very important. So um, yes, um, much more systematic identification and use of opportunities for engagement with member states and, 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 and other actors on how to advance our protection goals in both mission and non-mission settings. Uh, we're also trying to, to improve our uh, data collection system throughout the system so that, that, that we also improve our joined up analysis, uh, which has also been a very weak point in UN system as a whole. Just to, um, and much has been said already, so I don't want to repeat my colleagues have said. Naomi also mentioned the change in nature of conflict. I also think that we should look at type of, types of conflict where we haven't really talked about protection of civilians too much. Uh, for those of you who may not have seen it, I highly encourage you to look at uh, Secretary General's speech at the Web Summit in Lisbon, uh, where he's been also very focused on so-called frontier issues. 
there are increasingly crimes are taking place also in a cyberspace, and there are threats that are increasingly played out in a cybersphere as well. So now, this is not the time to be talking about that because we're focusing on protection of civilians in mission settings, but often we're, as, as they say, we're fighting the last battle and not the next one. So it's also important to keep an eye on continuously changing landscape and in, to make sure that the United Nations is prepared and positioned to respond appropriately. Thank you. Great. Th thanks very much, Ayaka. So we have, um, let's see, about 15 minutes for Q&A. Um, so let me open up the, the floor and, and take any questions for the panel. And if you could uh, please introduce yourselves, and I would ask you uh, just to ensure that we have enough time for closing remarks by Ambassador Allen to also please be brief. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the panel. And uh, I, I apologies, I came a little later, so um, I, this may have been addressed. But I'm interested in how gender has been integrated into the general DPKO uh, policy, and not just from the sexual violence aspect, but across the political, being a three tiered approach. How is it integrated into the political, the physical uh, as well? I'd be very interested to hear that. Thanks very much. Right, why don't we take a couple more? There was Thank you. I'm Savita Pandey with the Global Center for the Responsibility to Protect. Thank you for a fantastic panel. Um, Naomi, uh, a great piece here and, um, and a lot to think about. Um, my first question to you, just in terms of how would you, I mean, what's impact? Um, and how would you measure that? How would you measure impact in terms of protection of civilians? And really encouraged to hear about the fact that, um, you know, the DPQ is thinking about improving how we analyze threats. And, and coming from, a, from the Global Center, which works on R2P, we are essentially preoccupied by prevention of atrocities. And most peacekeeping missions right now are in areas where, you know, Kar, Sasadan, uh, DRC, where we are, you know, that, that remains the biggest threat to civilians. So uh, how are you thinking about including that particular kind of threat assessment in your larger um, uh, programs? And um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Great. Why don't we take uh, one more? There was one in the back. Oh, and, and Roel, we can take you as well. <laughs> Thank you. I'm left on Colonel Roel. Uh, but I thought the millard of Rwanda. Uh, I can't agree more with uh, everyone, uh, but uh, I would like to ask um, Mr. Kennedy. Uh, all the policies uh, have been uh, produced, all the, the documents, all the, all the discussions are organized, but uh, don't you think that there is a, a, a need for a more bold approach to it? Let me give you an example. In Rwanda, the genocide uh, against the Tutsi uh, was conducted by the government, the host, uh, the host government in case, in this case, a Minoir mission was in Rwanda, the host country was conducting the genocide. But then tools were used such as a radio a radio station calling names, go and kill A, B, C, D. Uh, you did not go, uh, do a good job in this province, go in this one. And even the international community failed to even you know, suppress it. There is a lot of technology these days. You can even bomb it, you know, and uh, somehow mitigate the the, the, you know, the effect of, of uh, the genocide. Don't you think that we can, leave the, we can leave the task to deal with spoilers, as uh, some of you uh, mentioned, to the peacekeepers? In the mission, we can do that. Our uh, commanders can deal with spoilers, can deal with small uh, commanders that want to rape uh, women when they go to fetch water. But then if it's the host country 
what do you really expect from us as peacekeepers? Thank you. Why don't we turn to the panel and then, then we'll see how we are on, on time before we take any more. Yeah. Well, thanks very much, Jake, and, and thank you for those questions. Maybe um, to begin with the question on, on gender that, uh, that Claire has posed, um, I think it's interesting that in the course of the evaluation that we conducted, all of the mission-specific POC strategies highlighted gender issues highlighted the importance of looking at potential violence and real violence against women, and not only in the context of conflict-related sexual violence. But what we thought was interesting was that um, unless we prompted it specifically by a question, there was no spontaneous comment to us about the gender aspects of POC, except from people who had in their titles something that had to do with gender or with women. So while we, again, we come back to this issue of institutionalization, it is, for want of a better term, I think it's as much about indoctrination as it is about training. It's understanding the doctrine. But I would take it a step further and say that you need to have that gender perspective, and this is, was, was another conclusion we had, as an operational lens, because you cannot address the threat without seeing it through the gender perspective. It's not just a question of ticking the box. It is a question of addressing the threat. So um, one of our ultimate recommendations was that the whole issue of gender needs to be elevated to the strategic priority that it really is in all aspects, from recruitment and deployment of personnel to the analysis of threats and ultimately to the outreach to communities, et cetera. It can't be boxed in just to be conflict-related sexual violence and cannot be just sort of, you know, the women and the kiddies sort of approach. It's got to be that, that women are part of, or that gender, that, that perspective is needed if you're going to understand context and threats. So just in response to that. Um, Colonel, thank you very much for that question. Um, you've, you've placed the most thorny question in front of all peacekeepers, um, which is how do you deal with a host country or a host authorities that are responsible for perpetrating violence against their citizens. Um, everybody acknowledges all of the PC POC strategies recognize that the mandate is there to prevent that violence or react to that violence regardless of the source. We come back to the typology problem that Baptiste talked about. Well, does that mean against bandits and does it mean any kind of violence from anybody? Well, the short answer is, according to the Security Council, yes. There's no prioritization, but what do you do in terms of ultimately losing the consent of the host country for your deployment when you're dealing with state-sponsored violence against civilians? And here I come back to the point to throw it back into the laps of the Security Council. There really has got to be that overarching support. I see some grimaces in the front row, and I, I apologize for that. But the, the bottom line is no SRSG, however forceful, or however committed, is going to be able to go to the president of country X and say, stop this killing and deliver on that unless she has the full backing of the council, and not just in New York at capital level. And maybe just another footnote to this. Last week, the senior leadership program was held here. It's a point where ITS brings together about a dozen uh, leaders from, from different missions. And I sat through part of the the session, and one of the DSRSGs who was attending after a discussion on POC said, wait a minute, why are we talking about mandates? We're the United Nations. We have an obligation under the charter to protect civilians, full stop. We have to do whatever we can. In Rwanda, maybe then it meant putting a microphone inside a washing machine and jamming the signal of Milkolin, but it wasn't done. But in Rwanda, it also reminds me always of the story of, of Captain Bayan Dian. Dian, I'm sure everybody in the room knows the story. I won't go into the details. But here you had an unarmed military observer with Munamir who is credited with having saved the lives of no one knows how many people, surely hundreds, maybe thousands, by going out at personal risk and escorting them and being a presence at various places to remove them from the threat. We don't hear about that story very much, and certainly it pales in comparison to the failure. But that passion for committing the ultimate act to be able to 
fulfill the mandate, a UN mandate. He didn't have a Security Council mandate under UNAMIR for protection of civilians, but he understood that that was his job. So that's, that's perhaps not a response entirely to your question, but I think it's important to bear in mind what Nami has mentioned. You can't risk POC becoming a sort of dispassionate bureaucratic thing. There has to be fire in the belly. And unless there's fire in the belly at the level of the leadership, you're not going to see it from the mission as a whole. I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you. I, I, I'm glad you raised this issue of the impact because that's really the most difficult question. Um, I was in DPA some time ago, and the, the, the million dollar question there is how do you prove that we succeeded in preventing conflict? It's the same thing. So I'm glad that IPI has started this project, and I, I really hope that um, under IPI's uh, leadership, there, there is some more work done on this, because the, the fact of the matter is, as um, Kevin just alluded, I mean, peacekeepers are saving lives every day, right? And that's not enough, because every failure is failure too many, so we have to do our best to tr try to prevent that. But yes, it's true. I, I, I think that, uh, that we could be much better served by having better, better understanding of what what is it that yeah how, how how do how do we have a structured conversation about what we're doing is 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 the best that we could under the circumstances and how how we can improve in areas that need to be improved yes thanks um, so maybe on the, the question of impact, uh, I will continue on this. Um, it's true, it is the most critical question and also the most difficult one. It's very difficult to prove that you actually prevented atrocities and that you uh, uh, prevented the wars from happening. When we talk about impact in the paper, I think we really have, the thing will be, will have to be broken down. Um, UN action should be um, outcome focused, impact driven. And um, so there's different types of things to consider. First, considering uh, the whole question of do no harm. Every activity that UN missions um, engage should actually have this component of analyzing what can be uh, the consequences of this activity or this tool being used for the protection of civilians and are we putting people at harm or are we helping them? So we take the example of a joint protection team, for example. It's great to send joint protection teams uh, composed of, uh, of uh, human rights officers, civil affairs officers, military and police officers to go and analyze uh, the different threats and to have a, an understanding of what's going on and to talk to the population about these threats. But when you use the tool, you need to be consequent about it. You need to actually think about, if we deploy this small team to a small village, um, is it gonna make a difference? Um, and are we maybe putting people at risk? If we send this small team of civilians escorted by five or six peacekeepers to a remote village that maybe we won't have a chance to return to, uh, and in this village we know that the population is scared and is controlled by an armed group and probably there won't be any leverage after the visit of a joint protection team to really make a difference. Uh, are we still sending a team and asking questions and pushing people to talk to us even if it can put them at harm? Uh, so the do no harm is, is something. Then the Outcome is really important. What are we looking for when we are negotiating with this armed group or when we are uh, doing this sensitization activity? Um, what would be the outcome? Uh, will the armed group leave the city, for example? And, and I think all this analysis needs to happen and happen very often, actually. It's just that, again, I'm not, I think institutionalization has defaults, but it's very important as a starter to actually uh, put in place the right processes. For example, the information analyst available in the mission can provide this vision of the opportunities and the risks and, uh, and, uh, and uh, the consequences, the possible outcomes for each activity. And then beyond the, the short-term out outcome, you need to think about the impact, and this goes back to the political strategy. Um, there are several tools that are used and that could be further systematized, like, for example, this new activity that were implemented in the, in, uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, pull, uh, the, the, uh, the polling sorry, of perceptions, uh, popular perceptions of security, asking people what do you think about your own security and do you think that peacekeepers 
are helping you and are securing your village. We need to have this exchange with uh, the communities and the beneficiaries because if we want to have a people-centered protection uh, of civilians and people-centered implementation of these activities, then linking with the beneficiaries and understanding their opinion on are we doing well uh, is actually crucial. And in this regard, I think um, uh, the new tools not the, only the new tools, but all the tools deployed by, by DPKO and DPET and the best practice officers that are deployed and the collection of best practices are great tools and initiatives and should be, uh, should be uh, further developed. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Tammy. And Baptiste, uh, please, if you can be... Yeah. Uh, quickly on, on gender. Uh, I mean, as Kevin said, it's in policy, it's in most of the strategies. Uh, what's, what's missing really now is in the field, having women, making sure everyone is, is you know, disaggregating the figures, the analysis uh, to include in the planning. So it's, it's making sure it's really operationalized. Uh, everyone gets the message. It's uh, it's about building it now in the mission, in the in the in the machine, in the DNA, uh, and and presence of women colleagues with us is key and is very low. Uh, another one uh, is 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 the difficulty for all of us as protection people and to coordinate on that. Uh, is sexual violence an individual protection issue or is it a collective protection issue? Can you have an operation on sexual violence? No. You want to protect the whole village and prioritize your actions and take specific care of women and kids. Uh, so, so it's about defining uh, how we approach those issues and agreeing uh, within the mission uh, on all this. Uh, that's on gender. On, on the part for, for the relations with state and whole state, that was with monitoring and evaluation, the two main topics at, at the time we developed the policy uh, where we did not propose and, and, and a solution, a detail, uh, give examples, because we were still learning from the missions, we were still consulting on that with the C-34 on how to approach uh, that support to state, especially when it becomes difficult. Uh, so this is what one of the things I've reviewed this year with different missions. In MINUSCA, uh, you, you, can, you do not work the same way with the state as in Darfur, as in other places. But this is, for me, the political approach part of this. A state is a lot of institutions, a lot of people. So it's not their friends or their enemy. Uh, it's, you ha may have a few spoilers. You may have some offices that are uh, you know, working on IHL with the mili military and in guidance and in training, and they are supporters. The military prosecutor can help you and start arresting high commanders in the army. That's what we did in MONUSCO. And when they both un and us understand that the first responsibility is do no harm, and that's how we gain the trust and can actually do something, that's the argument that works. And then you leverage what you have, HRDDP, that was the conditionality policy for us in MONUSCO. We say we're not giving fuel and food if you don't behave. And we'll try and do the same. Last point on the, the impact. I would say, I mean, we, we've had a note of guidance uh, recently produced on the indicators. The whole question now for me is, do we want to micromanage the missions uh, in you know, identifying indicators? My personal opinion, this, this is ongoing, in ongoing work, uh, but, but at the field level, if you have 10 specialists around the table, police, military, civilians, all with their skills, they will have their indicators and their you know, training and format in mind. It's just about understanding the, 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 the concept of the policy. Do I address every single incident of violence? I don't have capabilities. So how do I work on those strategic threats? How do I frame impact outcome, all that I do, on, OK, priority one, identify where could be the massacres? And how is this built? It's the political violence. It's not a tribal conflict that will result into the political violence. It's the instrumentalization by a spoiler behind. Uh, and that requires mission leadership to make a few phone calls, political affairs at the HQ to work with a few MPs, in addition to our colleagues in the field engaging with those that are the actors of violence, uh, but not those behind. Uh, so the, the, that link uh, is important, and I would say for the tactical analysis, etc., it's about the prioritization rather than the indicator itself. Uh, but indeed, impact assessment, it's perception, and it's not only the number of killed, it's as well how you manage all the rest, and how you analyze and capture through perception <coughs> surveys, through analysis, uh, stakeholder mapping, etc., to know how to, to, to work on that end. Sorry. Great. Thank you. 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 Th
Great. Thanks very much. Um, let me please invite Ambassador Allen to make some closing remarks. Okay. Um, no, just just two points. Um, just on the, on the gender point, I, I agree absolutely with Karen. I think gender has to be elevated. And, and Claire, by the way, congratulations on your <laughs> new appointment. Um, <clears throat> um, and and I think it's it's very much about also ensuring that the voices of women are taken into account when we do try to turn around and take a more preventive approach to. To POC, and that we don't do because we do actually on that take a very institutionalized approach where we just sort of tick boxes off. Um, and now that we're renewing, uh, revising the POC policy, I think that'll be a good opportunity also to build in some checks and, and balances to ensure that gender perspectives are integrated in how we do um, POC. And then just the second point on um, threat assessments that that's so we've recently started asking missions to do forward looking threat assessments. Um, and and we're finding that there's the, it's it's more complicated than we think. There's a method, methodological and analytical um, challenge, um, and so we're working on that. And actually, on Monday, we're having another workshop precisely to look into how we can do more effective threat assessments, learning from institutions such as yours that that do that sort of work. Um, so I'm happy to discuss that also. Offline. Great, thanks very much, Naomi. And my apologies, I certainly didn't mean to. Uh, to cut you off now, let me uh, please invite Ambassador Allen to make some concluding remarks. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm Jonathan Allen, the DPR of the UK. I bring you the lap of the Security Council, uh, as described by the panel. It's right here. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> I'd speak in particular as the UK is the pen holder on protection of civilian issues uh, in the Security Council. So it's something we believe very strongly in and have been very involved in. This has been such an interesting session and debate. I've scribbled all over my beautiful uh, prepared remarks. And I'm going to try instead to uh, think of a couple of a few things that really occur to me out of all of this. To shorten my comments, I'd like you to take for granted all the things I would have said about British propaganda, about how much we do take it as read. We put our money where our mouth is. So the first the thing that is really interesting is the description of how this uh, this, 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 uh, this crucial issue has sort of gone from something which is almost permitted and happened uh, organically uh, in, uh, in mandates to a place where it is required and increasingly the key priority in Security Council mandates. And I thought it was a really interesting depiction from all the panel and the way that process that had happened, um, which, is a, which is a really important thing and it's not surprising because the United Nations, particularly the media, tends to be judged on this issue more and more. Uh, but it is really interesting to think about the ways in which sometimes when something becomes so mainstream, uh, it, it can need that redefinition. It can need uh, that moment of, of, of sort of re almost de deconstruction and reconstruction because it does. if it becomes too mainstream, it loses its impact. So I think uh, uh, there's something quite important there. I remember my current prime minister once turning to me when I told her in a meeting that the foreign ministry was mainstreaming something, she said, when things are mainstream, it tends to mean no one takes responsibility for them. So I think it's really important we, 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 uh, we make sure that doesn't happen. Um, and on impact on that space as well, I think it's really worth saying just how hard this is. This is a really difficult agenda. Uh, it, is, it is cutting edge. We're not always going to succeed. And we need to accept there will be failure and learn from it. Uh, and I say that having uh, today been in the Security Council looking at the mission in South Sudan and discussing that with a humanitarian briefing from Mark Lowcock, which focused on deliberate starvation of civilians and deliberate uh, uh, gender abuse. And, and you know, we have to uh, be ready to learn the lessons and, and understand what happens and accept how hard it is. Um, so I think moving on from that, uh, this has been an increasing part of the Security Council's agenda. Um, both in the focus of peacekeeping missions, but also thematic resolutions. And we've seen uh, resolutions on protection of civilians in armed conflict, on children in armed conflict, and in the last few years, resolutions on the protections of journalists and the protection of medical facilities. But I quite liked the idea uh, or the thoughts coming about uh, being much clearer and putting an onus back onto the council. I think that's really important. There can be uh, a tendency, I think, in briefings, in, in papers, in um, reports, to, to sort of hit the middle ground a bit, not to, not to be seen to be too extreme in one's reporting. 
And we all, and I include the British Foreign Office in this, absolutely, we all have a bit of a tendency, even when things are going really badly, to report, you know, po little minor positive things. So you could look at a number of ongoing embedded conflicts uh, around the world right now, uh, and you could read a set of reports that said it's incrementally getting better every year, and yet the situation appears to be worse overall. So I think there is something about being really honest with the council and being really honest where the council isn't giving you what you want and giving the secretariat what it wants. I think that's a really important thing that you should do. And I like the idea of a specific protection of civilians briefing. That's a great thought. Actually devoting the time of the council onto that one issue and confronting what it is that we need to be doing. So I think that is really important. I think clearly there are different views in the council. Uh, we see that disagreement in this area. We see it over the prevention agenda full stop when it comes to reform. We see it over human rights at times. All of them linked. Some countries are very much more nervous than others. And we talk about a divided security council, but actually I would also flag up the importance of a security council in line with, its, with the fifth committee of the United Nations General Assembly uh, and of countries on the security council brackets, particular permanent members, close brackets, uh, ensuring that they don't agree a mandate in one place and then destroy it in another. And we need to be really clear about calling that out as well. And then I think the last couple of points I'll make, because I can see a white note coming my way if I'm not careful. Uh, on peacekeeping more broadly, the UK has a, what do we call our three P's agenda. We want better planning, pledges and performance. And I think these are things that would go some way uh, they're not radically, brilliantly, intellectually new, but they are things that would go some way to improving how we could do protection of civilians. So better planning and integrated planning, uh, and we would add to that intelligence-led. Intelligence with a small eye, information, whole situational awareness, a whole picture, not suggesting that the UN is going to do mass surveillance in country. But better planning, pledges that enable proper force generation and, and, and allow for capabilities that may be required. Um, and performance, holding people to the different standards required, uh, ensuring that we have better training and, and, and we, we address issues and we don't sweep them under the carpet. And then I come back to the politics. You know, as always, this has to be through the lens of politics. My last two comments. Firstly, uh, we've talked about a whole of mission approach, which I think is really important. We also need to think through the whole of the cycle of this, if you like, crime, uh, from preventing it in the first place, to effective reporting of it, to effective law enforcement and prosecution, to effective justice. So accountability is really important along with monitoring and reporting, and that should be something which we're ensuring that the UN system in country is supporting. And then lastly, coming cycling back really to where we started uh, uh, with Naomi, um, really this question of whether this is right to be institutionalised uh, or whether it should be personalised. And I think probably, as a good civil servant, my answer is going to be it's both. It needs to be both institutionalised and personal for everybody involved. And it has to be a shared responsibility between the UN and its member states. So thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Allen. I think today's discussion um, has been incredibly rich. It's provided a lot of practical insights. I think. For IPI, also starting a new pr uh, project on protection of civilians, it's also given us a lot of very constructive input to think about how we refine this project. And we very uh, much look forward to working with the Secretariat uh, over the, the coming two years to deliver a, a project that actually helps, uh, helps you in, in redefining the protection of civilians so that it does what it ultimately needs to do, which is save lives on the ground. So uh, please uh, join me in, in thanking all of our speakers today. And let me also just point out that uh, this is what is the first in what will be a series of IPI discussions on protection of civilians. And we very much look forward to seeing all of you, including uh, the panelists and participants at future events. Thank you very much.